Yes, since it's oh, two minutes after nine. So where's the yes? Okay, if folks want to play along at home. Wow, that's like loud. <laughs> no, it's fine. Because it'll keep them awake. <laughs> 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 lost a third of your audience. <laughs> yes, but a third for nothing. <laughs> here comes more. Shut we'll look at one. Everything's working so far. But I'm just getting started. <laughs> Give me a minute. <laughs> Fair enough. So if you go to the uh, conference wiki page for this session, there's a link to this presentation. And if you actually happen to have a Google account, I think you can change my slides as I go along. <laughs> so <laughs> he really shouldn't have said that. <laughs> <laughs> but but I must because he's, like he, he's lucky Tom Ryan's in another room. <laughs> well, that's right, Tom. Hi, Tom. Yeah, he's not here. We miss him. There you go. See, I can have an audience. Okay. So <clears throat> this presentation has a title that has something to do with I think Case Corpus was in there mm -hmm. and open open uh, open access case law and then OAI, which is the Open Archive Initiative. There we go. Um, I'm going to just talk a little bit about um, some of the stuff that Callie's doing with the uh, with op with the Open Case Law stuff that's around, and then and then Tom's going to get into all the fun stuff about OAI and interoperability and stuff. And, and he's right. Just remember that. No matter what I say, he's right. Um, so we sometimes, I sometimes this, what can I do with 710,000 federal cases? Um, because that's how many I have, um, thanks to uh, publicresource.org, um, who uh, got a big, who actually purchased, I guess, with donated money, um, a large chunk of federal uh, case law from the uh, circuit courts and the Supremes and uh, put it online so that anybody can get it. So you too could have fun with 710,000 cases. It doesn't even take up that much space, by the way, in case you're interested. Um, the indexes are actually considerably larger than the total volume of the cases. At least the way I index them, anyway. Um, so, First of all is my introduction. In case anybody doesn't know, I'm Elmer Masters. Uh, official title is Director of Internet Fun. Wait, does this work? Ooh, I have a laser pointer. That's dangerous. So that's good, yeah. Everybody, does everybody have their blast goggles? <laughs> <laughs> you probably didn't need, you probably didn't know you needed welder's goggles to attend this session, did you? Um, the, uh, actually, I'm the Director of Internet Development for Cali. Um, and, and I always like to start off by saying that anything that I say is not a Cali product announcement. So that, like, if I happen to say offhand that, you know, we're going to be, you know, building the next, you know, Westlaw Crippler, uh, we're really not. Or, yeah. But it's not, it's not actually an announcement of something that we're doing because a lot of this stuff we're just either kicking around or it's just inside my own head. Um, and also, any and all trademarks of other companies are their property and not mine. So, just like to mention that. So, uh, the first thing is um, where you know where's all this coming from? Um, the, of course, everybody here I assume knows that for years you've been able to get a lot of case law from different places for free on the internet, right? But it's been scattered around. The LII has some. Um, Emory has some, uh, Toro has some, uh, I don't know, law schools, 
Villanova has some, Scattered Wash, uh, Washburn has some, uh, Rutgers Camden has some, uh, you know, and then there's always been Fine Law and some other stuff, and so, you know, Justy has come along recently, and then there was Alt Law and, and a whole bunch of stuff. But of course, that stuff's sort of scattered and hard to get at and, um, uh, you know, not terribly useful if you want to sort of have all of it in one place. Um, because it's all been kind of, you know, cloaked in ads or, you know, sort of sitting behind, you know, bad markup and all that sort of stuff. So it's been kind of chaotic. Um, and about, well, it was released like late last year um, and, uh, and, and over the winter they, they put the final version at publicresource.org, um, Carl Malmud raised some money and released, hey that's handy, I was afraid it was going to overwrite my presentation. Um, at publicresource.org, and you can get all sorts of stuff uh, from there. Um, so for example, there's, there's uh, copyright law and Edgar stuff and GPO stuff and patent stuff and, and trademark stuff. Now the thing is, is that a lot of this stuff is snapshot, right? So it's like sort of point in time stuff when Carl got the data and, and there it is. And the courts.gov stuff is like that too, um, in that it, it is a snapshot of, of opinions, but it's a really big snapshot and it goes way back. And, and, but they're not really necessarily committed to keeping it up to date. So that's still up. Is that right? That's about right, Tom, right? That's my understanding? Yeah. Um, although, given the, the level of interest that he's seen in this, he, I think he's thinking about that a little bit, but, you know, hard to say. Um, and, and you can actually download um, all of the, uh, the sources or, or, you know, whatever you'd like um, from, from the website here. If, you, if you'd like to play with it yourself. And I know at least a couple of people in this room have done that um, for various things that, that they're doing. So, um, so all this stuff is up there, um, and, and that's a, a, a really a good thing because it, it answered a threshold question that, um, that we've had a lot of times with, you know, whenever we want to do something that uses case law, right? I'm, Probably everybody's at least heard whispers in the hallway about something called Elangdell. And uh, <laughs> Lord knows I have. And um, you know, one of the things about Elangdell is we wanted to be able to make, as part of the teaching materials, obviously law faculty like to use case law. So you know, where were we going to get all that case law? And, and that was actually really hard to, uh, really hard to say. I mean, you know, where, where would we get all that case law? Um, and, and we were sort of left with the possibility of having to buy cases that we wanted and, and it was, and, and, you know, but they were poorly marked up and, and so it was, you know, a, a lot of these um, sorts of things, you know, because there was always that threshold of where would you get the case law to do Project X, right? Why don't we do open source shepherds? These are all things that have been suggested by actual living librarians, by the way. Why doesn't Cali do like an open source shepherds or open source key numbers? Um, and, and, and we were always able to say, well, where would we get all that case law? Well, now, of course, we can't say that because we've got all the case law. Um, but, but that's always been sort of a threshold problem was that, that it wasn't easy to get, even though it was freely available. Um, you know, I'd certainly tinkered around on and off for years with different scripts that went and scraped stuff from here and there, but it was always hard to maintain and frequently broken, as I know Tom has done with the, with the, uh, uh, with the lower, with the circuit courts and some of the lower court stuff um, with, uh, with LII, and, and LII went out and actually, you know, set up deals with the Supreme Court and, and, some, and some New York State courts to actually get uh, you know, get the material in, you know, at least a reasonably standard format for at least a couple of weeks at a time before the standard change. <laughs> um, but that's always been a problem. But now that's not a problem because we've got all of that 
um, all of that data is available. So, you know, the first thing that, that I did with it was uh, had John go and register the name Case Corpus. Um, the second thing we did <laughs> um, was actually to just, you know, set it all up and, and index it so that you could, so that it can be searched against. Um, and and casecorpus.org is live, and you can you can actually search for it, or search in it. Um, and you will get uh, you will get cases back. Um, and and this is actually not intended to be used for, like say legal research. It's sort of more of a proof of concept stuff. Um, but it'll probably stick around a little bit, um, and then so so you can you can actually then get get cases and they turn up and they're they're nicely formatted and if you looked at I, if you look at them in Firefox they do nifty little there's um, nifty little styling things that like highlight the section you're running over and stuff that just doesn't work in IE six so um, but they lay out and they even have. No, I picked one without footnotes. How they managed to do that? Um, but footnotes are in here and linked up and, and stuff, and 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 different sets of people are working at identifying the uh, identifying the sites that are inside of, of cases and then linking them to known sources for those cases, so that you know you get that. I haven't really toyed around with that that much because other people are working on it and I'll just use whatever they come up with when they get done because I'm working on other stuff. Um, so, uh, you know, so that's, um, that's out there and we're actually, um, we are actually also building this into, where's Josh? Okay, if I open this, should I open this in IE? Okay, never mind. <laughs> um, we're we're still debugging the, the new Cali website so it works on or the new the Elang Dell website stuff so that it works in IE six. So that works right. Is Firefox loaded on here? because um, basically we're building um, you know, we're we're building all of this stuff. I do not see it. I've seen it on some but not on all. And I think that that's the thing. But Anyway, we, we can pull we can pull this into um, we're working on, on being able to, to, to pull these cases into um, into the Elang Dell system so that faculty members can edit them down um, and uh, and and, and redistribute the edited versions to their classes um, and that's kind of the primary thing that we're doing with um, with the case law stuff um, and. Uh, uh, and that's um, that would be ready to run uh, just as soon as I finish debugging all the code. Um, but we'll actually be looking for people to test that probably within the next month or so, um, because it is it is that far it is that far along. So um, so that's um, you know that's, that's kind of the, the thing that we're we're doing. The other thing that. No, that's not what I wanted to do. I just closed that so they didn't know. Um, the other thing that that uh, that I did with Case Corpus was I created a little resolver. So if you feed it citations, right? So that's a site. Does that look like a good site? Yeah. Nine forty nine F second twelve forty one, and if you just put that on the end of of a call to Case Corpus, so we'll just do a copy. And we'll paste it in here. Um, that will return the case. Um, there's actually no magic there. It's just a it's a one really short Apache rewrite rule. Um, but you know, and 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 again, though it's easy to do because I've got I have all that data. If I was pointing it at somebody else's site, they would change the directory structure for reasons that only they would know, and then my thing would be broken, and, and all that sort of stuff would happen. So, 
Um, but um, so that's sort of one of the benefits of actually having control of that data as opposed to just having access to it. Um, and that's about all I've got for right now because it actually is the end. And then I know Tom's going to talk about much more fun stuff. No, oh, would I ever? Pass me the might and majesty there. Yes, sir. Let's see if I can actually wake up both of my computer and my mouth. We'll take one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, which one now? Can we vote on which one now? <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> Do you want the laser pointer? There's nothing worth pointing to here. <laughs> Uh, Homer already did a certain amount of. Oh, I'm not. Yeah, I turned it off. So. Oh, thanks. Uh, Homer already did a certain amount of stage setting. I'm going to do some more. Um, the first of which will be to tell you that I, I'm trying to break my PowerPoint, Jones, and, and so any ineptitude with this particular presentation software is owed completely to unfamiliarity and. Uh, You're sitting in the feedback. Case to the written material. Oh, so I am. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to ditch this thing. Or at least turn it significantly down. Can yeah, you do you that? Can turn it down. Okay. I hate them anyway. Um, what I want to do is give a quick overview of what is going on with open access to law stuff in many quarters these days. A fairly lame overview, followed followed by an, an equally lame demonstration of a couple of toys uh, that we're working on at this point. Um, there are some things I'm not going to talk about that are reasonable things to worry about in this arena, uh, mostly because they're policy questions not particularly of interest to this group, but they are surfacing and milling around the whole open access question. It has really, really opened the floodgates on the privacy issue. All sorts of things appear mostly as collateral damage in judicial opinions that those who are discussed in those opinions would rather not have available through Google. Uh, a surprising amount of the time, as I say, it is collateral damage. It's nothing to do with the parties involved, but it's some judge who, for some unknown reason, decides to reveal some piece of personal information that the world would rather not have, that the, the individual would rather not have known. It, it's, it's bizarre the way this happens, but, but there it is. Uh, another interesting question around all this, particularly as we begin to move toward the sort of thing that Elmer was talking about a moment ago with key numbering and that sort of thing is, well, if we're going to sort of crowdsource or, or wikify the idea of things like key numbers and classificatory metadata in general, now, is there really much that much wisdom in crowds, right? I mean, uh, who's, who's really authoritative about how to classify this stuff, and, and do we, how much attention do we want to pay to that sort of thing? Uh, there's some feeling that, like, Wikipedia will con converge on the good. Uh, who knows? But it's an interesting question, and one which I'm quite happy not to discuss today. <laughs> uh, the other thing I want to do is make some slightly cranky observations. Uh, mostly based on what has happened in the field over the last year or so. There are, 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 are numbers of people out there who seem to believe that open access to, to the law became a sort of issue at the point where the people who had previously been concerned with badgering the RIAA got interested in it. Um, that's not really the case. Uh, as a concept, it goes back at least as far as Edward Cook in 1628, who you will recall was responsible for the famous phrase, ignorance of the law is no excuse. Uh, if you actually read that in context, what Cook was talking about was an intellectual access problem. The fact that law at that time was unreadable by most of the population, uh, being in law French. Um, fast forward 150 years or so to Jeremy Bentham in 1780, and you get a man who was, if nothing else, a rabid ideologue in favor of public access to law of one sort or another. There's a sort of priceless quote from him, if you can decipher it. I, I used it in a blog post a while back. Um, I, I, I'm leery of having you actually try to read this, because I'm not sure that you can. Uh, I love this. Basically, what it says is, 
never mind that you're not involved in any litigation and may not be a lawyer, my evidence book is really kind of interesting anyway. Uh, but the whole idea was, uh, was that he was and did imagine himself to be writing for a lay audience, and he did see that intellectual access to law was a, a, a terrific sort of problem. Um, going back even more recently in the United States, there are all sorts of things that have happened that have had some bearing on this issue. There was the plain English movement, which for the most part, as far as I can tell, turned into a discussion about typefaces, but actually was for a while a discussion of how to make legal documents readable by the public. Uh, various access to justice operations at one time or another said, well, we need to be able to get our hands on the case law, we need to be able to get our hands on the statute. There are these ideas of public law libraries. There's an element of it in the preventive law movement, and there are elements also in, uh, among the law and development people who see legal transparency as a way of creating economic benefits primarily in, in places other than the United States, but, but, but not limited to there. So there's all sorts of people who have been thinking about this for a long time, and then there's an internet activity. Uh, oh my. I hate software, don't you? Uh, it's an internet activity. Um, it, it's really been around for a while, too. Uh, the, the, the first documented appearance of law on the internet was actually uh, the Supreme Court's Project Hermes releasing data to the Cleveland Freenet as early as 1989 or 1990 as an FTP site. Nobody's really sure when Hermes began, including the Supreme Court, which I actually think is kind of funny. Uh, they, they, they dribbled a few decisions out there and it gradually stabilized and, and, uh, and got to the point where uh, Sarah could probably say with great accuracy. But at the uh, at the beginning of the 1991 term or so, it was finally stable and going out the way it should. But that, that, that was uh, lurching along on FTP sites for a while before we came along. We came along in 1992, and of course, there have been many, many, many others since. Most recently, PRO, Alt Law, et cetera, et cetera, some I'll talk about in a minute. Um, a final introductory set of observations. There, there, there are three things that I think that any reasonable global legal open access architecture needs to consider. The first is that for 90% of the audience out there, case law is not the main point. Uh, I realize that's a fairly heretical observation in law schools, but the fact is if you put F second or F third online, who exactly are you benefiting? Lawyers primarily, right? I mean, the public is not screaming for interest in this stuff, but if they are, uh, they see it primarily as an interpretive layer on top of statute. They want statutes, they want regulations, and they will go into case law to the extent that they need that to interpret the other stuff that they're looking at because, as the f other two balloons point out up there, the audience is not the same as it was for printed legal information. It is the general public, and it is in particular a professional slice of the general public that is making use of law for professional business purposes. It's not. It is a bunch of people out there who are having, as, as I often say, episodic traumatic encounters with the legal system. They are going broke, they are getting divorced, they are you know, going bankrupt, they are going to jail, whatever. Uh, but beyond that, there's a significant core audience that is really business people. You know, my, 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 my touchstone example is the hospital administrator who's doing public benefits law. It's a very, it, it, it's a very, very different audience. Uh, and they don't do research the same way. Uh, they really don't, not at all. Uh, they do not do comprehensive legal research in the way that that is taught uh, in law schools. They do something that is much more akin to risk management, WebMD-ish sort of assessment of what they're hearing from professionals. In general, they're approaching these systems by saying, well, what am I expected to do? Now, that's really what they're trying to find out. What am I expected to do? Not how am I going to litigate this? how many different possible treatments of this have there been throughout human history, et cetera, et cetera. It's what am I supposed to do? Uh, so in that sense, you know, the kind of quintessential legal information consumer in this world is some dry cleaner who is trying to figure out what the heck to do with his toxic chemical. Uh, the second thing that has changed vastly, and, and now we're out of introductory material, is, is sort of who's in the legal, inf legal info sphere uh, now? as of 2008. In the research community, you see a bunch of really interesting actors now that you didn't see even two years ago. 
there's a very interesting application being developed by the engineering school at Stanford that has to do with reconciling ontologies in ways that allow architects and engineers to look across the building codes and regulations of multiple states to see which ones correspond to one another. It's an automated ontology construction project. Uh, there's a guy at Wharton at a business school who is doing stuff with <coughs> Edgar filings that would be extremely useful to anybody trying to extract free-form metadata out of case law headers. There are political scientists out there doing tons of stuff with notice and comment rulemaking, who's doing that, how it's done, what the comments look like, how to classify them, etc., etc. Computer scientists doing natural language processing with uh, interest in all that stuff. Information scientists looking at information structure. Uh, and finally, there in very, very, very tiny letters, you see law schools. Uh, because frankly, the amount of activity along these lines in law schools is absolutely minuscule compared with what's going on almost everywhere else. And if you think that's shocking, I'm right there with you. Now, as to who's online running websites, what a motley crew, as Elmer was saying a few minutes ago, and, and some of the motliest are in this room right now. Uh, but let's start with official bodies, right? Uh, per the EGOV Act of 2000, we've got all federal courts now theoretically online, and in fact, most of them are in compliance with new opinions. What they haven't done is the back file. That's the gap that, uh, that Carl and, and those of his guild are filling. Uh, state courts, a little bit of an uneven record there. I think, the, I, I think this is true. Librarians in the room can tell me if I'm right or not. I, I think all of the state highest appellate courts are now on. Uh, with current archives available, and there's a very spotty record in the lower courts, the intermediate courts of appeals, and then, you know, the lower you go in the food chain, the less likely it is to have happened, I think. Is, is that a fair statement? Yeah. Uh, legislatures were always ahead of the pack because, you know, if you're elected, you kind of want people to know you're doing something, so you start <laughs> publishing legislation, <laughs> whether it makes any sense or not. Uh, there are tons of agencies doing what I would call riding the e-government wave in different ways, right? They all involve slightly different notions of what citizen government interaction might be. I mean, one of them I, I'm referring to here is the DMV model because it's really a very simple interaction, re-registering your car, uh, all the kind of stuff that used to operate through the Secretary of State's office, all that sort of procedural stuff that people do with government, all that ministerial stuff. Uh, there's a lot of intragovernmental business process that is now taking place in some kind of electronic space that involves document exchange. Uh, meaningful dialogue with the public is less common. Uh, that's probably true in any government system, but uh, <laughs> it's, 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 it's true in this one certainly as well. Uh, but there is some going on. I mean, there, there's been, uh, uh, first of all, there's the whole phenomenon of notice and comment rulemaking, which I'm not going to talk about today. Second of all, uh, there's other sorts of consultative activity going on. A lot of it, uh, a lot of the best stuff is coming out of places like NIH or the Social Security Administration or the Census Bureau that have long histories of interaction with the public anyway. Uh, they, they've moved into this realm quite naturally. Uh, others have not. Um, overall, one of the things to note is that None of these legal information blobs within government are entirely distinct from one another anymore <laughs> if they ever were. Everything is at least, in, at least tacitly cross-referencing everything else. Boundaries are very hard to, dis are very hard to talk about. Uh, it really should be what somebody used to refer to as a seamless way. Uh, unfortunately, mechanically, it isn't. Uh, but it's getting increasingly hard just to look at one piece. Uh, the second thing is to remember is that that, you know, I mean, that obviously has some implications for interoperability. You want stuff working together. And one of the reasons that you want to do that is that different audiences start in different places with this. I mean, I, I said a moment ago that the, the public research process typically starts in statutes and regulations and moves to case law. Uh, there are other communities that move in the opposite direction. It's, it's, it's very hard to know sort of navigationally which audience is going to do what, uh, but they all do exhibit certain slightly different characteristics, and that says a lot about how you design. Uh, now, we have a wide variety of new arrivals on the scene. Um, first of all, I mean, you know, in 1993 there were three LIIs, us, the Canadians, and the Australians. Uh, there's now just a lot 
uh, somewhere between 18 and 23, I think, this week. Uh, and they're all different, right? I mean, some are research institutes operating under government. Some of them are de facto national resources in the way that the Canadians and the Australians are. Some are very small grant-funded operations in developing countries. There's just a ton of them out there. Uh, indeed, some of the best work right now is being done in South Africa. Uh, there, there's, there, there's, there's quite an interesting group uh, that essentially wants to function as a, as a regional group for Sub-Saharan Africa doing stuff there. A um, ton of stuff going on there, so many, many, many more of those gone. Um, advocacy organizations are getting in the game, as Elmer has pointed out. You have public.resource.org, you have OMB Watch, which is doing primarily regulatory stuff, uh, and an operation called the Sunlight Foundation, which I find fascinating because they're sort of rallying, uh, they're rallying open government activists around questions of government information in ways that I think are going to turn out to be actually quite productive. Uh, they're very good at doing things like going and talking <coughs> to people on the Hill about why exactly it is that the CRS reports aren't available uh, and, 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 and those kinds of questions. There are some new academic players represented here, Alt Law, uh, University of Cincinnati doing, uh, doing STAT-L and, and that sort of stuff. And then there's some other guys that I'll, I'll call the Law Sort of Comps. Um, Justia, which is offering free case law that they're subsidizing by running what amounts to a web design and lawyer, lawyer directory business. That, uh, that's being run by Tim Stanley, who was one of the Find Law founders uh, until that, he got out of that when it was sold out to West. Uh, Fast Case, uh, which for all that they are a commercial service, I think has their heart in the right place. They offered Carl Malvin some very deep discounts on, uh, on what they sold him to do public.resource.org. Um, and, I, you know, and there are others. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that I've missed 22 in talking about this. Uh, the thing to remember, of course, is that all of these new guys are really, really very different kinds of birds, right? They're differently motivated. Some of them are offering this as a loss leader to make money. Some of it are doing public service. They're decentralized. Uh, they're administratively independent. They're built on top of different funding models, ranging from the commercial to now, the Canadian LII has a $30 head tax on every lawyer in Canada. That's why they have a staff of 35 and I don't. <laughs> uh, there aren't that many lawyers in Canada, or it would be 70. Uh, everybody's a little bit differently funded, and they're operating in a very, very, very wide variety of national settings. I mean, think about it. If you want to be the national free-to-air law resource for Australia, you probably have to get 20 people in the room to do that. Yeah, just just to make, just to form the agreement. Imagine what you would have to do in the United States to do that, right? I mean, it'd be a five-day conference with you know thousands of people and so forth and so on. I mean, you're just operating at a very different scale, and a lot of these things get get easier to do. So I guess the bottom, the the, the, the conclusion from all of that is that everybody's situation is really very, very, very different when it comes to this stuff, and it's not surprising that people are taking very different approaches to it. Um, all of this points as Elmer has said, and I will go on to say at considerable length, uh, to some need for standards and interoperability. Uh, I think it's really, well, let me, let me go on. I, I want to talk for a minute about what's essential to that idea, uh, this idea that all of this stuff could operate seamlessly. We need some set of agreements about metadata. You know, we need to know what sort of data about this stuff everyone's going to be circulating. Um, that needs to be something that is standardized to a degree and that is sensitive to cost factors. Uh, we all know from experience that what I'll call four corners metadata, metadata that can be extracted automatically from the document itself is actually relatively cheap, uh, at least if the formats are stable. Um, you know, some programmer sits down, spends a couple of days, writes an extraction program. Uh, presumably, if the underlying textual standard is stable, that remains stable approximately forever. We know that classificatory metadata is extremely expensive because you're paying someone there to say, this one goes in this box, and this one goes in that box, and this one goes in the other box. Uh, to the point now where actually West's process is at least partially automated. They use a, a set of, uh, well, fancy automated classifiers that result in a voting system that's ultimately arbitrated by a human edit editor. That's, that's the way their stuff works at this point. It, it's, it is machine supported, however. Um, 
And as that indicates, language technologies will help with this to some degree, although what's interesting if you start playing with that stuff is how unevenly that works across the legal corpus. It turns out that it's pretty easy to use a computer to spot a copyright decision or a social security decision or any decision in any area of law that, surprise, surprise, is a child of statute. Uh, because there will be statutory references in there that are sort of strong discriminators for, for, for sorting these things out. Once you start playing around in constitutional concepts like, oh, say, free speech, life gets real rough because the only discriminators that you have, okay, so presence of the phrase First Amendment uh, is a false positive of one sort or another, right? Uh, because that could also be free exercise, it could be, you know, X, Y, Z, you know, better than I do. Uh, there's room for some help there. It's not clear how much help and where. Anyway, we need some way of doing metadata cheaply and in a standardized way. We need a way of finding out who's got what. You know, what's where. Uh, and the kind of performance that we've seen out of the circuit courts and others like them on this issue has been really quite dismally poor. Nothing is standardized across the federal government in, the term, in, in terms of the way things are offered, presented, spiderable, not spiderable. Etc. 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 So we need some way of finding out what's where. Uh, we need a way of linking to newly available resources online, particularly from legacy documents and particularly from legacy namespaces and citations. Which is to say, even now, if you look around, there are a big bunch of documents out on the web that are not now and will never have their citations linked to hypertextual collections by any automated means. Just not going to happen. Nobody's going to do it. It's too much trouble uh, to actually cover the entire world. So we need some way of working around that. Uh, and last and certainly not least, but not a topic that we're going to be able to go very far with today, uh, we need some sustainable funding models. Uh, as I've said, the funding models that exist are really diverse. I do not know of any operation anywhere in the world outside of government that is doing this that is not in some sense financially imperiled at this point. There really isn't one. Um, we got to figure out who's going to pay for this stuff and how. Um, here are some things that I don't think are essential. One is bringing everything under one roof. You know, there's always this impulse that says, oh, let's make our own Westlaw. We have to have everything collected everywhere in order to do that. No, we don't. It's a distributed internet. <laughs> uh, the other thing that we don't need, at least immediately, I think, is probably standardized case markup. It would be nice to have. Uh, on the other hand, <coughs> standardized case markup as opposed to standardized metadata schemes. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at a case and you look at the number of things that you might think about marking up in a case, it's a limited population and basically any first year law student can figure it out, at least at the end of the first year. Uh, once you have XSLT available to you, once you have the, avail uh, the ability to do namespace transformations, it doesn't really matter what, you know, as long as everybody's looking at the same logical entities, it doesn't matter if you call them Oink, Bow, Wow, or Moo. Uh, you, you can still find ways to transform those things one into another by automated means. Uh, that's my way of saying that I don't have time in my life for a protracted wrangle over case law markup standards. Uh, maybe somebody else does. <laughs> Uh, and, and indeed, maybe somebody else does. There are regional standards emerging at this point, particularly in Africa and Europe. Uh, in fact, if you want to look at metadata harmonization work in general, Europe is probably the place to do it. They've had to chew through a lot of that stuff as a result of EU harmonization. There are also good standards coming out of the Australian government uh, and some fascinating work that's going on in Africa where they're basically just leapfrogging everybody. Uh, there's some very, very, very good stuff going on. The other thing to remember is that we don't have to do this all ourselves, and that's going to bring me to the demos very quickly. Uh, if you think about this problem of diverse materials being presented by a widely diverse population of actors that are not administratively linked and are to some mild degree in some kind of academic gentleman's sense competitive, well, that would pretty much make you think of the state of science preprint repositories about 10 years ago because they had the exact same problem. 
So the people who were playing around with digital library work in the sciences you know, between five and ten years ago have really, have really been through a lot of the same kinds of issues that we're facing, not just with law journal literature, as I've heard many people you know, talking about institutional repositories and so forth and so on. Those same technologies can equally well be applied to the problems of federating case law collections and indeed really any kind of case law you want that's operating on a reasonably uniform metadata standard. These guys, of course, started out doing what we would like to do, which is make federated search work across multiple certain stovepipes. They tried a lot of approaches. There were lots of client server systems out there in which you ran searches individually at the node sites and brought the results back together in one big heap and so forth and so on. And a few years of fooling around with that taught everybody that it doesn't work. Uh, that once you scale much past about 50 different sites trying to collaborate in that way, you really can't do it. Uh, you become enslaved by the performance of the least well-performing node, uh, and you know the thing just becomes uh, unwieldy and unworkable. So that was a place where pulling things together under one roof started to make some sense. Uh, and so what they originated was the so-called Open Archives Initiative Protocol for Metadata Harvesting. Um, how many of you folks have run across OAI PMH before? Yeah, okay, so librarians have, uh, have basically, some, some, some others have not. Uh, we'll get a look at it here in a second in, 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 in very real terms, but the basic idea there is that OAI PMH divides the world into two classes of things, uh, repositories and service providers. Repositories are expected to make standardized metadata available to harvesters in a standardized way, um, all of which boil down to answering more or less detailed questions of the form, what do you got? Uh, service providers run around between different repositories and aggregate metadata together in order to provide services. Uh, union catalog concept, basically. Uh, with the added wrinkle that since one of the pieces of metadata that is typically collected in this way is the location of the actual documents along with the metadata, it's a very good way to drive uh, spidering and indexing software to run full text search. Uh, and it saves you the trouble of having to spider the site itself, which in the case of some of these database driven sites, uh, what's the one that, there, there's one, <laughs> this tells you something, there's one of the 13 federal circuits that uses Lotus Notes, I think it's the ninth. Uh, that is you know, just ridiculous to spider because that's how notes is. Um, it gets around all the sorts of limitations. Okay, so far, I should have mentioned I'm interruptible at any time. Oh, now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what's on your mind, Patrick? <laughs> Spit it out there, yeah, son. Tom, could we go back to your fifth step? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> what would you like to know? He just wants to see the word metadata again. Oh, okay. John, because it makes him feel all warm. Uh, did you have a question, John? Or? No, I was just... Okay, you're just yanking on me. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm used to it. Uh, I want to show you a couple of things we're working on. These are both kind of at the toy stage. Um, one we're calling OAI for courts. Uh, and you can actually get to it on this Wikispaces site and play around with it yourself. And if I were talented, I could figure out how to actually get to things on this monitor. Uh, OAI for courts is, at this point, a simplified way of implementing an OAI PMH server that will work with case law metadata. Uh, like anybody who is, and, and there were a couple of sort of fundamental notions behind it. One was that it should be fairly easy for anyone who is already running a case law collection to be able to work with. Uh, if you're building a database driven application with that set of ambitions, you're faced with one of two choices. You can either write your application in such a way that J random court can go in there and configure that application in such a way as to work with their existing database uh, collection, their existing relational database setup, 
which could be any one of a number of rel relational databases arranged in any one of a number of ways, all different, and you can drive yourself crazy trying to write code that makes it easy for people to go in and, I don't know, configure some XML file to make that all work, uh, and incur in the process a support burden because no living human can do that cleanly enough to make it genuinely easy. Uh, or you can take the tack that I chose, which is I'm going to make this thing work with one reasonable data schema, uh, and they can write little scripts that will take their stuff and jam it into that sort of relational database setup. Uh, and again, because it's case law, because the sorts of metadata that you can associate with case law are limited and easily identified, uh, that seemed the more reasonable approach. So it's one size fits all, but you have to make it fit. Uh, you have to write some sort of transformation script that will take whatever you have your metadata stored as and jam it into the database that this thing runs on top of. Uh, for those who are interested, and we don't have enough time to go delving into code now, but maybe later, it is a Rails application. Uh, took about a week to throw together. Uh, it wasn't terrible. So what's it do? Well. OAI PMH basically says, if you're a repository, you have to be able to respond to six verbs that ask questions like, who are you? So if I fire the identify verb at this thing, I get back a structured XML response that says who I am and what I have. Um, and you can see this is copiously annotated here. I won't put you through the tedium of walking through the whole thing. Uh, this is a fairly simple OAI identifier response. It just says, I am the OAI metadata repository. This is my base URL. This is the version of the protocol I'm running. This is who you mail if there's a problem. This is my policy on deleted records, blah, blah, blah. Uh, down here in the description fields, you can actually put all sorts of arbitrary XML if you choose to do so. Uh, and people do. You could say things like, this is the format of citations, I, uh, of print citations that correspond to my collections in the following ways. You could say um, anything that you can basically represent as structured data can go in there and, and, and as a description of your particular repository. So there are ways to essentially inform any harvester comes, uh, that comes by as to what you've got, how you've organized it, so forth and so on. Uh, there is also a specific provision for friends, uh, we have a way to tell people of other OAI-based repositories that we know about. Those two are fictional. Uh, so that you can go and harvest from them if you don't know about them yet. So there's a, there's a, there's a sort of a peer-to-peer -peer discovery system built into all of this as well. That's what Identify looks like. That's who we are. Now another really good question is, what do you got? Well, if I ask it, this, by the way, is set up on a snapshot of our Supreme Court data that was valid about four months ago. Uh, we haven't kept it updated because it's just running a little testing. As you can see, it gives back quite a lot of information about each document that it has. Let me scroll down a bit just to make it completely seasick. Uh, everything's in the form of a record. By the way, I suggest that you read the OAI PMH spec. It's actually quite readable for a technical specification. There are links to it off of that off of that wiki page. It'll give you a very close idea what's going on here. Uh, some main features of the landscape. Um, at its simplest level, what OAI PMH gives you back is unqualified Dublin Core metadata uh, related to a particular document. Unqualified DC has some real problems when it comes to representing case law. Uh, they are actually quite thoroughly spelled out in some ramblings of mine on that on that wiki site, but they basically boil down to this. It's very difficult to represent multiple authorship. Uh, it's very difficult to represent certain kinds of document to decision relationships. Uh, so for example, the Supreme Court chooses, for reasons known only its, to itself, to separate its, uh, the, the components of a judicial opinion for electronic transmission. The concurrences are in different files from the dissents, are different from the majority opinion, are different from the syllabus. New York Court of Appeals, on the other hand, runs them all into one document. Uh, so within unqualified DC, you have to have some way from the get-go of saying, 
this is how this stuff is organized and this is who's, who's related to me. Uh, that turns out to be a little tricky. Some kinds of ownership representation are tricky. Uh, if you're not going to do dumb stuff like assigning semantic significance through ordering, uh, you're limited to one date. So it better be the date of decision. There's no way to represent the date argued, the date posted, any of that sort of stuff. So unqualified DC is really kind of inadequate. On the other hand, uh, OAI does allow you to use arbitrary schemas. Uh, you just have to develop them and they have to validate. So if you want something better than unqualified DC, you're more than welcome to develop it. We will do a level two specification that is better than unqualified DC, but still well within what most courts are likely to be carrying in case management systems. That's, that's, that's kind of the boundaries ar ar around that design as, as far as I'm concerned, right? It needs to be something that they can easily hitch up to whatever form of case management system they've already got. Uh, but it also needs to go significantly further than unqualified DC does in representing what's actually in those cases. Okay, so far? I'm talking fast. I know and I need to talk faster because I'm running out of time. Uh, you can get, that was a list of all records. You can obviously get single records as well. Uh, OAI provides for something called sets. They are a strictly hierarchical arrangement of uh, partitioning of whatever's in the repository into sub-collections. Uh, in this case, what I've done is, is uh, split my mine into, as you can see, three sets. Uh, let me fold them up. So there's one uh, that's copyright decisions. There's one that's trademark decisions. And there's one that decisions mentioned vegetables. Uh, there aren't very many of those. Um, <laughs> I should have mentioned it is not that the whole thing is based on top of a uh, unique identifier scheme, the uh, particulars of which need not detain us here, but it has one. Uh, and it has one that can, it also has the ability to accommodate any sort of citation namespace that you want as metadata within the thing. So namespace translation is actually quite easy. Uh, uh, so you can also get back the contents of a single set. Uh, and that's really pretty much all there is to it. There are only six verbs in OAI, and most of the most of the code involved, frankly, the hardest part of the code involved is, is, is concerned with uh, parameter validity checking. Um, it gives you well-structured, known structure XML that is easy for others to parse in developing services. And basically, this is the glue by which collections will be made to work together or can be made to work together. Um, I'm well aware that there's a considerable public education effort involved in getting more than two sites to use this. Um, but it's work well worth doing. The South Africans are at this point uh, moving toward using this as the basis for all of their federated search within the 18 countries that they now take in under the uh, South African Legal Information Institute umbrella. Yes, John. As a practical matter, making a repository available, how would that work? I mean, it seems to be something akin to an RSS feed or just a, a URL to a CGI script that if accessed by a, a, a service provider would just get the contents back as, as you know, the XML as a result of the CGI. That's something right. Something like that? That's really all it is. So easy. Easy, very easy, very lightweight. Uh, you could write an OAI server from scratch in a day in any scripting language. Uh, you could do it, well, no, it would take you two days if you hadn't sorted through the argument validation problems, which are, which are nutty because of time stamping problems and stuff like that. I mean, it's complex and confusing, but I mean, you could do it in a day absent that problem, yeah. Yeah, and if you've done any other sort of web services stuff, like XML RPC or even anything you generate RSS feeds if you've written your own code to do that. This is maybe it is say. just a day, even because I know like RSS has twitchy things about dates and stuff. And that's replicated in OAI. <laughs> yeah. Apparently figuring out exactly what time it is is a really big problem. But <laughs> 
Well, yeah, I mean, uh, 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 figuring out what time it is is a really big problem, actually, because they designed this to work with huge collections of records that were being constantly updated. So, I mean, you know, like if you're going to fire this against the Library of Congress, <laughs> you sort of want to know when it was last updated, more or less to the millisecond, right? Otherwise, you might not be so so concerned. But uh, it's not that hard, guys, do it. Uh, is there a relationship between the, the metadata specs that this uses and the uh, some of the semantic web stuff developed by the W3C, like uh, OWL or uh, RDF schema? Not inherently. Okay. There could be, yeah. uh, which is to say that if you're going to use any kind of semantically oriented, ontology oriented data, you could find ways to pack it into this. Right into this format. That's the thing about arbitrary schemes, right? right. Uh, so, and if, I mean, if you wanted to do something as complicated as, say, I don't know, a TEI header or pick your favorite example from, mm -hmm. uh, from science fiction, uh, and, and stick it in there, sure you can do that. Uh, one of the things that I think is going to be interesting as we develop this going forward is keeping it just simple enough at every stage. As I, as I say, I, I have a sort of mental upper limit for phase two that is whatever's within the bounds of what courts are currently doing in their administrative systems. Phase three could be anything you want. Uh, and I suspect that as we try to internationalize it and deal with language problems and, 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 that's going to get quite complex, quite layered, and start looking at least superficially like the way some really ambitious standard like TEI was organized into layers. Right? So you're going to have some layer for classificatory metadata, you're going to have some layer for internationalization, and da 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 da. Hard to say how it'll play out. Yeah. yeah and, and the real fun stuff, because this is fun, but <laughs> the, the real fun stuff is, is that you know, we'll be able to tie educational materials like with you like that. I'm just trying to but the <laughs> um, but but you could you could tie uh, materials associated with cases to the cases through something like this by making those also available through AI and, and getting in that friends list for example or just through you know sort of you know offering your materials uh, as a service as well, or, yeah, as a, as I get some of the terminology confused, but so making your 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 educational materials collection accessible, and then using, uh, and then and then tying that into into case law stuff and and, and it together so that you can get those kinds of of, um, of interconnections. Got one more toy to show you. Uh, actually, let me just wrap that by saying another way you can look at this is, <coughs> is, is to say that what OAI PMH does for you is more or less it, it's it's Google sitemaps on steroids uh, for all intents and purposes because you're offering full metadata along with the locational information, which sitemaps doesn't even attempt to do. Uh, and it makes spidering and particularly selective spidering. Uh, in other words, I'm not interested in spidering this unless it meets certain metadata, passes certain metadata filters. Uh, they said very, very, very easy for third parties to do. Uh, when you contrast that with the sort of agony that we went through and that I assume you guys are at Alt Law in dealing with non-standardized circuit court uh, operations, Yes. It looks it looks really 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 attractive because as as I as Stewart's grim looks are telling me here uh, the, 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 on, on that stuff the maintenance never stops no it, it never does and uh, this is this is a clear alternative to that provided you can enlist the cooperation of the yeah that, that's my next question how, you how do you do that yeah, yeah good question uh, I mean I'm I'm hoping to have a meeting with some people at National Center for State Courts in, in, okay. in the middle of July to get them moving on it we're very friendly with the New York reporter of decisions at the federal level okay. it's not clear who you talk to yeah. uh, I mean what we're eating here is a tradition of judicial independence verging on judicial orneriness uh, that, that has its basis in separation of powers. I mean, there is no standard setting body, nor can there be one. And one of the unfortunate things about dealing with government people on this stuff is that they somehow believe until you knock them hard on the head three or four times and then wait a month and do it again, 
uh, that standardizing labels on things means you're somehow trying to standardize the things. Uh, it's as if they believed that by telling them that they had to have red telephones, you were telling them that they could only talk about one thing. You know, it's this strange sort of strange sort of mindset that they have, and uh, it's very difficult to overcome, frankly. Uh, I did say we were going to do some things about with namespace issues. Uh, this little uh, what, what you see here is a toy uh, called Cider. Um, it's designed to solve some of those linking problems that uh, I was talking about a moment ago. So if we just drag and drop this little bookmarklet up here, we can then jump into an arbitrary text decision pulled off a circuit court site. Highlighted citation.